Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, on our father Adam, our father Abraham, on Moses, on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed, Prof the blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. We greet you wherever you are in the world with the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We now have listeners in uh, New Zealand. So it's going to be about 11 o'clock at night in New Zealand. I'm sorry about that. But this is the 8 o'clock in the morning in Trinidad. It's the earliest that we can have this program. So I'm sorry you're going to have to wake up. Uh, wake up late to, ho to see the program in New Zealand. We return today to our subject of money. We will be staying with this subject for some time, for some more time. We want to begin today's program by recalling that Allah Most High has declared in the Quran that he sent down this Qur'an to people who think. People who think are a people who think things out. They are different from sheep. They are different from cattle who will eat biryani and then go to sleep. A people who think are people who seek to understand to penetrate the reality of things, not to live with the super, superficial appearance, which can be different from the reality. So the Quran was sent down to a people who think. And the Quran declares of the scholars of Islam, they call the ulama, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء بَعْلَ أُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That it is the ulama, the scholars of, the, of Islam, who truly fear Allah. And hence, it is the true scholars of Islam who can teach, who can guide, who can warn, who can lead. When the true scholars of Islam are not allowed to do that, when crooked people use their checkbooks to take over the leadership of a community, and they become the guides now, and the true scholars of Islam are silenced, what will be the fate of such communities? Around the world today, we are led by crooked people. Around the world today, our situation is pathetic because those who are competent to teach, to guide, to warn, to lead, are pushed into a corner and cobweb upon them. And they are silenced while crooked people take control. But the situation is worse than that. When a people refuse to think, they're in trouble. But when the scholars of Islam refuse to think and do not think, what will be the fate of the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? When the scholars of Hinduism, the scholars of Christianity, the scholars of Judaism give up thinking, particularly on the subject of money, give up thinking. They don't want to think. They cannot think. They refuse to think. What will be the fate of the world? These are the questions with which we begin today's subject. The subject of money is the best one of all to use as a litmus test or a yardstick with which to measure are we thinking? What does the Quran have to say on the subject of money? We have done it last week. In the Quran, as in the Torah, as in the Hindu scriptures, I'm sure the Hindu scriptures also, money 
is gold, gold coins, dinar. That word is in the Quran, but nobody tells you that. And a dinar in the Quran is made of gold, a gold coin. That's money. Money in the Quran is dirham. The word dirham is in the Quran, but nobody tells you that. No. They have time for big, 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 big conferences, but they never talk to you on the subject. Why? What's wrong with them? What will be their fate in the grave if they continue to remain the mysterious silence? Huh? Money in the Quran is dinar and dirham, a gold coin and a silver coin. But money is also, if dinar and dirham are in short supply, gold and silver coins, then you can use articles of food consumption, commodities of food consumption, which are in abundant supply in the market and which have a shelf life because the government cannot ban rice. It looks like a fool. A government cannot ban sugar. They can ban gold, yes, but they cannot ban sugar. They cannot ban wheat and barley and dates and salt and so on. So these are also uh, articles of food consumption. They can also be used as money. So money in Islam, money in Christianity, money in Judaism, money in Hinduism, money in the religious way of life, is always money with intrinsic value. The value of the money is inside the money. Not in George Soros' pocket or in somebody's pocket in Washington. The value of the money is created by Allah Most High. He preserves that value. So money in Islam always has intrinsic value. Will you not think? When will you think? How much more time do you need to think? I'm talking to the scholars of Islam. They're not going to be happy with me this morning, but I've talked for long enough. 20 years is long enough. So if they see some anger in me today, they can understand why I'm frustrated and angry with them. Even if I want to teach them, they wouldn't want to listen to me. They don't want to study this subject. What's wrong with them? Money in Islam is also money which preserves value. Where in the Quran? In Surah al kaf The young men went into the cave and Allah put them to sleep. Surah al kaf of the Quran, Surah number 18. And they slept for how long? You know it. They slept for 300 years. What the surah is saying implicitly, implicitly for people who can connect the dots, not like those who use the Salafi methodology where you don't know even about the dots to be connected. The Quran is implicitly saying that after 300 years, the money which they had with them could still buy the food. Implicit is there. And so money in Islam is money which not only can function as a medium of exchange for buying and for selling, not only as a measure of value, how much to pay for the tomatoes, how much to pay for the melanjan, but also money in Islam is money which can store value, preserve value over a long period of time, 300 years. That's money. And finally, again in Surah al kaf of the Quran, if you will take a little time to spend with your Quran, you have time for everything else. You have time to recite Qasida after Qasida after Qasida in praise of the Prophet. Will you not take a little time for the Book of Allah? What's wrong with you? Is it not there in the Book of Allah, in Surah al kaf the man who had some money and wanted to leave, leave it for his orphan children, he is dying, and he wants his orphan children to get it when they grow up. What did he do? He dug a hole and buried it and built a structure on top of it. And I ask you, can you bury electronic money? Where has your brains gone? And if you bury paper money, what's going to happen when they grow up? When I was five years of age, my father bought a car. 
here in Trinidad. And he took me to the market. And with these eyes, I saw my father buy a hundred oranges for one dollar. I'm not talking fiction. I'm talking what I saw with my own eyes. He bought a hundred oranges in the Shaguanas market for one dollar. Today, one dollar cannot buy even one orange. Is that money? If you bury that money and you take it out after 20, 30, 40 years, is, does it have any value, any worth? No, money in Islam is money you could bury in the earth to save it for safekeeping. And after you take it out, it has preserved its value. I have covered this subject already in my last lectures. We can go on and offer some more verses of the Quran on money, but these are the main ones. But now we want to turn to something more than the definition of money in the Quran, in Sunnah. Allah speaks in the Quran and he says, Ba'da'udhi billahi min ash rajim Surah to Tawbah, Surah number Nine. Itakhadu ahbarahum warahbanahum arbaba min dunillah wal masiha banna maryam wa ma umiru illa ya'budu ilahan wahid la ilaha illahu subhanahu amma yushrikun surah al tawbah Allah says they took their priests and their rabbis, the Christians and the Jews, they took their priests and their rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. Oh? And they did the same thing with Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, the Messiah. Taking him as a god beside Allah. But they had not been ordered other than to worship one god. There is no God beside him. Glory be to him, far removed is he from this shirk. What is shirk? Shirk is blasphemy. Allah says, even if my servants come to me with sins as high as the sky, I can forgive them all, but not Shirk, not blasphemy. The one sin that Allah will not forgive, even though he is a kind, he is a merciful, he is a compassionate, he is a loving, he is so kind, yet this is the one sin that he will never forgive. If you die with this sin, it is shirk. If Allah... says he's far removed from shirk and taking your priest and your rabbis as God and Lord beside Allah is shirk. Well, what were they doing? A man came to the prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and said, O Messenger Allah, the Christians do not worship their priests. How could Allah say so? And the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so in the Quran? That's the question. And the Prophet replied and said, Did they not make permissible what Allah had prohibited? Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is shirk. If you make halal what Allah made haram, that is shirk. If you make haram what Allah made halal, that is shirk. Yes? Ask any scholar anywhere in the world, whether it be Hindu or Christian or Muslim or Jew, but who follows the religious way of life, ask him, can a 17-year-old be married? Yes. In every religion on the face of the earth, a 17-year-old girl can be married. Allah has made it halal. Government of Trinidad and Tobago in an act of unprecedented foolishness. The government of Trinidad and Tobago 
in an act of unprecedented foolishness for which they will pay a price for a long, long time to come. I promise you that. Have now made it haram, but Allah made halal. Attorney General doesn't know that. Perhaps not be not liberally endowed with knowledge and intelligence. So Trinidad and Tobago now says, a girl who is 18 years of age can be married, but 17 years of age she cannot be married. So you're making haram what Allah made halal, and that is blasphemy. That is an act of shirk. And whosoever accepts that legislation have now joined in the shirk. Yes. The Prophet said, did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is their shirk, the priests and the rabbis. And did the people not accept it like the people who are accepting this stupid legislation? That also is shirk. And so if Allah made gold and silver money, made it halal, and the International Monetary Fund made it haram, I ask you, would that not be shirk? And if the people accept the substitute, the paper money, for the gold and silver, the reason why they made the gold and silver, the gold haram, is because this substitute, this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram substitute of paper money, this cannot survive so long as there's gold in the market. That's why they have to make it haram. If they make haram what Allah made halal, namely using gold as money, and if we accept the substitute, and we say this is halal, are we not also in shirk? I ask you this Sunday morning, Sunday, of course, being the day for the worship of the sun, and for us, it is Yawmul Ahad, the first day of the week. I ask you in this morning of Yawmul Ahad, if the IMF made the gold, use of gold as money, if they make it haram, as they have in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, and if Allah made it halal, would that not be shirk? You better think. Because when you are in your graves, it will be too late to think. And you're going to be questioned in the grave. And I am sure, I'm I am certain, among the questions in the grave will be what money. What is money? I'm certain of that, yes. I have no doubt about it. Among the questions in the grave will be what is money? And if we accept the substitute, the bogus and fraudulent substitute, would we not also be in shirk? Can you find today a scholar of Islam anywhere in the world, a prominent scholar, anywhere in the world, any mufti, any maulana, any sheikh, any of these high-flying ones who come to the big, big, big conferences, can you find any one of them to declare paper money is haram? No, not at all. This is the pathetic situation that we are in today. Now then, excuse me. Before we proceed with the subject of money, our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, informed us of what's going to happen on Judgment Day. The Hadith is located in Sahih Bukhari four times. But nobody, nobody, nobody ever quotes this hadith. They're scared of it. They'll run from it. They will teach you every single subject under the sun, but not this. Not this. They're scared of this. It is judgment day. And Allah says to Adam, alayhi salam, Take out the people for the hellfire. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O oh Allah? And Allah says, the one God replied and said, out of every 1,000, take 999 for the hellfire. 
the companions of the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, were terrified when they heard that. So he looked at them and he smiled. He said, the one for Jannah, for heaven, will be from you, meaning, meaning someone who follows the truth. Someone who follows the truth and is righteous in his conduct will go to heaven. But then he went on to say that the 999 would all be Ahlu Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, people who are part of the godless world order of Gog and Magog. So in the end time, because Gog and Magog belong to the end time, and you will know that you're living in the world order of Gog and Magog when you see the Jews being brought back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. That's the Quran, but nobody studies the Quran anymore. When you are living in the world order of Gog and Magog, then you will see a global society emerging. For the first time in history, and all of mankind will be living the same way of life using the same money. Yes, that's what we have today. And 999 out of 100 will enter into the hellfire. Now, if Allah is kind and merciful, if he is a forgiving God, if he is a compassionate God, and if he says, I'm prepared to forgive all sins, even if you come to me with sins as high as the sky, I can forgive them all. But the one sin I will not forgive is shirk or blasphemy. Then how can we explain 999 out of every 1,000 entering into the hellfire? I want to suggest to you, because you, my, my viewing audience, wherever you are in the world, you're in France, you're in Britain, you're in Singapore, you're in Australia, wherever you are, you are thinking people. I know that. That's why you're listening to me. I ask you, how can we explain 999 entering into the hellfire out of every 1,000, except through shirk? That's the only way we can do it, blasphemy. And so they're going to use something that will embrace all of mankind with shirk or blasphemy, and all of mankind will enter into the hellfire. And I want to suggest to you, because you are a thinking people, that our paper money that we're now using and the electronic money which will now replace it, which has come to take the place of gold and silver, which is halal, and this is haram. It is here that the shirk is located, as well as in stupid legislation that says a girl cannot be married before she's 18 years. There is one level that is called dotishness and another level which is called foolishness, and then the highest level is stupidity, and this is, what is, this is what this legislation is. But they would not accept it from me, so let them wait until they are in their graves, and then they'll know, and they'll remember what I've said. The prophet warned about the shirk, which will come in Akhirul Zaman, in the last stage. He said about that shirk that it'll be difficult to recognize it. So you have to turn to those who have eyes and who can see. They are the ones who will recognize it and point it out to you. And then you have to accept what they're saying if you cannot yourself see. How difficult will it be to recognize the shirk in that age and that time. Let me tell you how difficult. He said, the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam said about the shirk, he said it will be as difficult to recognize as it would be to recognize a black ant on a black stone on a dark night. That's difficult. That's how difficult it will be to see the shirk. And yet, be careful, for that shirk is coming in the age of Gog and Magog. 
It will become a global society. It's called globalization. It will be embraced by shirk. And you should not wait until you are in your grave to recognize it. Because Allah gave you a mind with which to think. And today, your brother Imran is here to talk to you. If you're a Hindu, and you worship one God, and you oppose oppression, yes, you are my brother. I'm come, I've come today to say that to you. If you're a Christian, and you worship one God, and you oppose oppression, you are my brother. You're a Jew, and you worship one God, and you oppose oppression, you are my brother. And this money that we're now using today is one of the worst instruments of oppression ever invented by mankind, by evil people. The Quran warns us. Now we turn to the subject looked from another viewpoint. And I have to share this with you. The Quran warns us about a moment in time when history will experience great change. That a countdown will now begin, which will culminate with the return of the true Messiah, the son of Mary. Countdown begins with a certain event and will culminate with the return of Jesus when truth will triumph over all rivals when Jesus comes back. And justice will triumph over injustice and oppression. And the oppressor will bite the dust. All men and women of integrity look forward to that day. Yes, when Jesus will come back. None more than the Muslims. For when Jesus comes back, we follow Jesus. Oh, yes, when Jesus comes back, there will be a prophet of God on the face of the earth, and we have a duty to follow him. Once he's the messenger of Allah, appointed by Allah, we have a duty to follow him. He's there amongst us. We can meet him. We can touch him. We can listen to him. We can see him. That's the Jesus who is coming back. But when a certain event takes place in history, a countdown will begin, which is the last countdown in the last age. And during that period of countdown, the world is going to be enveloped with universal shirk, blasphemy. That's why we had this stupid legislation from the PNM government of this country. I feel embarrassed, really. I feel embarrassed because the legislation did not arise from conditions in Trinidad, where 13-year-old girls and 14-year-old girls are already sexually active and having abortions. And this stupid legislation comes to say, you can't get married. That is stupidity of the highest order. And you're going to pay a price for it. I promise you, you'll pay a price for it. Yes. This is the Quran, that an event is going to take place. What is it? When that event takes place, mankind should now be aware that forces are going to be unleashed in the world. And the world is going to experience a re-enactment. A re-enactment of that epic encounter between truth, which had no nuclear weapons and no tanks, and no state-of-the-art weaponry. Truth, which was just a handful of people led by Moses, Musa alayhi salam. Truth being persecuted and terrorized and tyrannized by the great oppressor who declares, Ana rabbukum al -al. I am the Lord Most High. He can make it halal, I can make it haram. Pharaoh. That epic encounter between Pharaoh and Moses will be repeated in history. When Pharaoh was drowning underneath the water, a few thousand years ago, something happened. 
What was it? As he was drowning, he realized that he is not God. No. <laughs> no. When he was alive, he was claiming, I am the Lord God. You must worship me. You must follow me. No other religion except my religion. But now that he is drowning underneath the water, he realizes he's not God, and he declares his faith in the God of Moses. Oh. Oh, says Allah. Nobody knew of what's hap happening underneath the water. No one knew until the Quran came down. If the Quran is indeed the word of the one God, then this is truth that the Quran is now revealing. So you have a duty to examine the credentials of the Quran as the word of God. This book will help you. We just launched this book last Sunday before a mighty audience of 25 people, yes. The methodology for the study of the Quran and the first chapter deals with the credentials of the Quran as the word of the one God. So this book says that when Pharaoh was drowning, he declared his faith in the one God. And then Allah responded and he said, al -an, now Pharaoh, now you declare your faith when you're dying. And before this, you were in obstinate rejection and rebellion. And you were perpetrating facade on the earth, corruption and destruction. This day, Pharaoh, this day we have ordained that your physical body, your badan, your physical body, after you die, will be preserved. Why will we preserve your physical body? Why? The Quran is answering that question. What is the answer? What is the reason for which Pharaoh's body is being preserved? Why? Litakuna liman khalfaka ayah so that those who come after you, a people who come after you, it will be a sign for them. What is the sign? My understanding. And you should never ever accept my viewpoint unless you are convinced that I am correct. Because you are a thinking people, that's why. And I respect your intellect. My understanding is that the sign is that a people to come after Pharaoh in the end time will live the way he lived, with arrogant, obstinate rejection of the truth, declaring themselves and behaving as though they are the God most high. That he said a girl at 17 can be married, but they say, no, a girl at 18 can be married. 17, no, she cannot be married. So they declare of themselves, they are the God, they are the Lord most high. The Lord can make it permissible, but them can make it, the PNM government in this country can make it prohibited. Yes. A people to come after, after you, Pharaoh, who will live the way you lived, oppressing the believers, oppressing the believers, waging war on them. You will live the way he lived, and you will die the way he died. That's what the Quran is saying. The body of Pharaoh was discovered in 1897. And I have news for you. Shortly after the body was discovered, the Zionist movement was established in Basel in Switzerland. Two weeks ago, I was driving from Geneva to Zurich and then from Zurich to St. Gallen, which is close to the Germany, German and Austrian border in Switzerland. And I could see the sign. Basel is only about 56 kilometers away. Yeah. The Zionist movement was established in Basel in Switzerland a few months after the Zionist movement was, before the body of Pharaoh was, a few months after the body of Pharaoh was, sorry, 
The body of Pharaoh was discovered a few months after the Zionist movement was established in Basel in Switzerland in 1897. What followed after that? You have to be able to connect the dots of history to do what I'm now going to do. Because I was blessed by Allah Most High to study international relations. I studied international politics in two universities. I studied the history of international affairs in two universities. I studied them here at the University of the West Indies at the Institute of International Relations. And it was the most exciting year of my life. And I had excellent teachers. Professor Dr. Leslie Maniget from Haiti taught me international politics. And I have to thank Dr. Eric Williams, the, the first prime minister of this country. I have to thank, always thank Dr. Eric Williams. Yes, may Allah bless him. And may Allah have mercy on the soul of that man. Because of him, Imran Hussein was able to study at the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies with excellent teachers. And Imran Hussein is now able to do what he's doing today because Dr. Eric Williams did that. When I left, well, I came first in the exams in my, at the end of the year, and then they sent me to Switzerland to do the PhD at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, which is the most prestigious institution in Europe. And I never had the teachers out there like I had over here with Dr. Leslie Manigat, Dr. Neville Linton, and so on. So while I was here in Trinidad, I got the skills to be able to connect the dots that I am now going to connect. This is 90, 1897. And in 1902, in 1902, they came together in Paris in a conference to plot the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, which is in control of Jerusalem. 1902. And it took them only six years, 1908, and they were able to achieve regime change in the Ottoman Empire, regime change. In the next lecture, I'm going to continue from 1902 to show you what happened in Riyadh in 1902, where they, they have a replacement for the Ottoman Empire because the Saudi Wahhabis take Riyadh in 1902. And then we go to 1907 and 1908 and 1913 with the Federal Reserve and then 1914 with the World War. But this will be our next lecture. We're now going to pause for a moment and uh, we then take your questions. If you are in Trinidad, uh, there will be a number which will appear at the bottom of the screen. You can call uh, with your questions. There will be a number coming at the bottom of the screen, yes. You can call with your questions if you're in Trinidad or you're in Tobago. Uh, if you're abroad and you do not have the internet, you can also call on the phone, but I prefer that you send an email if you can. And uh, we will simply, we'll start taking your questions in a short while. Thank you. Now have uh, some questions here which will be sent to me by email while we're waiting for your telephone calls. Um, when you're sending your questions to me, please tell me where you are, in which city and in which country. Uh, so our a viewing audience can benefit. Um, here is the first question. Respectable sir, salamu alaikum. Well, please don't address me as sir. You can say brother Imran, Sheikh Imran, uncle Imran, yes, but don't use the word sir. I don't like that term, sir. Yeah. I hope you're fine. The situation in Pakistan is growing worse day by day. And the media is playing a major role in that 
situation, situation becoming worse and worse. Uh, his question is, is this the war for power through money? Or are we going nearer and nearer to the end day? And the question comes from Peshawar, someone who is a medical doctor in Peshawar in Pakistan. Uh, and my answer is that Pakistan is not just another Muslim country. No. The Muslim community of India is one of the most important Muslim communities in the world. India led the world. Right? The intellectual leaders of the world of Islam, the scholars of Islam in India led the world as the intellectual leaders of the world of Islam. It was the Mughal Empire which waged bogus jihad on the Hindus. For Muslims to rule over India for so many hundreds of years, unjust war. The Mughal Empire did what the Ottoman Empire did in the Balkans, to set up the Muslims for slaughter. Yes, because if you wage unjust war on a people, including the Hindu people, they're going to hate you. And they're going to hate Islam, because Islam is an oppressor. That's what happened in India. And when the British came and took over India, they took over India in order to set up India for the moment when they would withdraw. That's why they took India. That's the most important reason. The other reasons for taking over India was to destroy the indigenous political system and replace it with a political system that is godless and defective and came out of Europe, where you have elections yeah, to form a government. And there's no transparency in the elections? No, because it's secret balloting. There is no accountability because nobody knows how you voted. No transparency. This is their terminology in our minds. This is no accountability. We don't have that stupid system. We have, if you make a political choice, you're accountable for it. If you want to accept this man as the leader, you are accountable. We have to know who you are. You can't come and rig the elections to keep Scotland in England. No. You have to give us a political system and an, a methodology for choosing leadership which is transparent and which is accountable. And secret balloting is for birds and for foolish people. So they, oh, we have a call from St. Augustine. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yes. Go ahead. I'm listening. Yeah. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, St. Augustine. Yeah. Um, Dr. Hossein, um, I just want to clarify on the point that you raised that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, gave us the permission to marry at 17. But um, you said that the government carried the age of the 80. Could you, could you point me to the Quranic um, birth where that um, decree was given that 17 okay. is the permissible right. age to get married? All right. Let me give you some homework. Go to any scholar of Islam who knows the Quran and who knows the Sunnah, anywhere on the face of the earth. And find for me one scholar of Islam which says that Allah has prohibited the marriage of a 17-year-old girl. My understanding, my dear St. Augustine, is that you'll not be able to find even one scholar of Islam anywhere on the face of the earth who will declare that Islam prohibits the marriage of a 17-year-old girl, but Faris Salwari has done it. And the PNM government of this country has done it, or they're trying to do it. And you're going to pay a price for that. Yeah. Uh, next, is there any more questions? Hello? Okay, we are talking about the uh, Pakistan. And uh, they took over Pakistan 
sorry, they took over India, British, British rule over India to replace the Mughals in order to set up India for what is to come. And that is what is going to happen after the British leave. But in addition to that, they wanted to replace the indigenous political system of Islam and of Hinduism, and Gandhi knew more about it than most people. What is the indig indigenous Hindu political system? Ask Gandhi. Don't ask Jawaharlal Nehru, who is secular. Ask Gandhi. What is the indigenous Hindu political system? What is the indigenous Hindu market? What is the indigenous Hindu system of money? Ask Gandhi, don't ask Nehru, okay? They did this to be able to replace gold and silver with paper money in India and so on. When the time came for the British to leave, the Muslims of India led by people who could not recognize that Muslim rule over Hindu India was unjust, was oppressive. You had no right to be ruling over the Hindus. What you could have done, if you had some sense in your head at that time, as soon as the British were leaving, was to apologize to the Hindus for Muslim rule. Apologize to the Hindu for oppression of the Hindus when an unjust minority is l ruling over the huge majority of Hindus. What you could have done to th was when, you were, when the British was leaving, the All India Muslim League or the Khilafat movement could not only have apologized, but do more than that. To say, listen, we don't want to rule over India. No, we, that's not our, our agenda. We will live in India. You rule over your country. It is your country, not ours. You rule over your country. All that we ask of you is to give us religious freedom, to live as Muslim. That's all, nothing more. If they had some sense in their head, you wouldn't have Pakistan today. Pakistan now is imprisoning the Muslims of, this, of, the, of the Indian subcontinent, and you are being set up. Those who have ruled over Pakistan were always appointed in Washington. Yes. And if a ruler were to ever come over to rule over Pakistan, who puts Pakistan first, like Trump is now trying to put America first, not Israel first. Hmm? That's why they hate Trump. If you, you have a ruler in Pakistan who wants to put Pakistan first, not America first, not Saudi Arabia first, the Pakistan first, they kill him as they kill Ziaul Haq, as they kill Liaquat Ali Khan. So Pakistan now is going to be subjected to uh, more and more oppression, yes. And the people of Pakistan are helpless, like slaves. I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. And you have some, some, some fairy land kind of hadith saying that there's a Ghazwatul Hind coming. A big war against India, and you're going to defeat India with your Muslim army, and you're going to conquer India. And so, a fairy tale nonsense. Your Ghazwatul Hind hadith, so called hadith, are fairy tales. Yeah? What is coming is nuclear war. And when that nuclear war takes place, it is NATO going to wage war on Russia and China. When that nuclear war takes place, then they'll use that opportunity to try to denuclearize Pakistan. But Pakistan is the only Muslim country today which has uh, nuclear weapons, and you cannot allow any Muslim country to have nuclear weapons. So they will attack Pakistan to denuclearize Pakistan, destroy its nuclear plants, and so on. And they can do it. Of course they can do it. And when they do that, they'll have to break up Pakistan, tukra tukra, into small pieces. And then Pakistan will be subjected to the rule of those around it. Uh, that is the, the tomorrow that is coming. Uh, let me go to the next, uh, the next question here. He says that uh, he seems to be also from Pakistan. Yeah. No, no, sorry, Bangladesh. <laughs> and this one is, um, 
he's not a medical doctor, he's an engineer. First, uh, Sheikh, please receive my hearty love and respect. I am your student from Bangladesh, and I've been following you since 2011. I've graduated from the engineering university, and I'm now at work. But as I suspected earlier, living Islam with sincerity uh, and doing my professional work simultaneously is impossible in these times. I'm well aware of your teachings and your advice, but Sheikh, the times are getting difficult. You've always been like a khidr to me, and I've been following you. Please tell me something that is heart-melting, some admonishing words. Also pray for me that I may remain steadfast and courageous. Also pray for me that I may get married soon. Okay, I pray for that. And I might find coolness and eyes and tranquility in my marriage. May Allah increase your wisdom and insight and knowledge, and may you always be a guide for people as you've been for me. Well, no question, all right. No question from Bangladesh. Someone wants to travel down to Trinidad to come and spend some time with me in April, beginning of May. I want to come with a few of my friends from where? From Canada. Um, and spend a week with you. You mentioned in one of your lectures that there's a hot market for silver in Trinidad. No, I didn't say that. I said that, if you're listening to me, I said that people in Trinidad and Tobago ought to acquire some gold and silver coins. He says that here in Canada, we have the most refined silver on the planet, 999.9. OK. And I would like to bring some samples with me. I would absolutely love to trade Canadian silver in Trinidad. Uh, no, I think I have some news for you. I have spoken with uh, the secretary of one of the masjid in Trinidad, a big masjid. And I have suggested to him, I'm not going to mention the name of the masjid, that since the temple in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus could mint gold and silver coins with no graven images. Graven images mean graven images of a human being or of an animal. That is what we're talking about, a graven image. If they could do it in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, we can do it in Trinidad. So I've asked whether this masjid can take the lead, because we don't have anyone minting gold and silver coins in Trinidad at this time. And we could buy the gold from Venezuela. They, they, they produce gold in Venezuela for 100 years now. And we can buy the silver from Bolivia. We can buy the silver from Mexico. They are major producers of silver. And we can buy the machines here in Trinidad, and we'll mint our own coins in Trinidad. I don't think we need to import. Yeah. And then we can sell the gold and silver coins to people, not just Muslims, Hindus, Christians, anybody. Anybody can buy us, buy from us and buy at the market price. OK, this one is from India. And it is from the city of Bangalore. And uh, this is his question. Dear scholar, Sir Imran, oh, please don't address me as Sir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi I listened to your lectures with complete, complete faith on Allah that he's given you such a great respect in this world through Islam. I was listening to your lecture yesterday regarding the signs of the times, part three, in which you mentioned that we cannot use paper money to give charity. I also said you can't use the paper money to perform the Hajj. I have a question that in today's world, people, including me, including me, we believe we're getting our food, we buy our food through paper money. And uh, there are people who are suffering from hunger. They have so many problems uh, because they have shortage of money. Uh, so could you kindly explain to me, if I have to help someone who is in need, and I need to help them with money, and I do not have gold to give them. Why can't I buy food, for example, with paper money and give it to them? And therefore, why cannot perform my hajj with paper money? OK. In order for us to answer the question 
of whether we can give charity in paper money or in electronic money, or whether we can perform the Hajj, paying for it with paper money or electronic money, or whether we can pay the mahar, the dowry, and we get married and so on, in paper money, whether we can pay our zakat in paper money or in electronic money. The first thing that we have to do is to determine whether or not the paper money is halal or haram. That's the first thing we have to do. And uh, our prophet warned. He said that in Akhiru Zaman or in the end time, people will no longer care for what is halal and what is haram, what is permissible and what is prohibited. No. They just write the check, brother. We don't care whether the money is halal or haram. Just write the check. Yeah. People will no longer care for what is halal and what is haram. So what we have to do is to first determine whether gold and uh, whether paper money is halal or whether it is haram. Uh, in my next lecture, we will continue answering that question when I first explain to you how the paper money came. What are the rules and regulations concerning the paper money and what is electronic money? Why is it that no mufti anywhere on the first of the earth, face of the earth is prepared to declare it is haram? When the evidence is mounting that it is haram. When you first decide it is haram, then I ask you, will Allah accept that which is haram? You are free to perform your hajj with your paper money. Nobody is stopping you. You are free to give charity in paper money. Nobody is stopping you from doing that. No. The question is, will Allah ever accept what is haram?